all your beautiful faces. I missed y'all. You know, the ocean is beautiful, but not as beautiful as you. And I don't say that sarcastically, maybe a little, not a lot, but I did miss each of you. It was a good time to get away with my family and enjoy our time together and kind of reflect on life. Have you ever sat and just allowed your mind to think on purpose? There's a difference, right? There's a difference to sit and allow your mind to think, and it just goes where it wants to go, but there's a difference in sitting, being able to clear your mind, and allowing it to reflect on purpose. I sat. I'm not a beach guy, but I sat in probably one of the most beautiful places I've ever sat and watched my kids play in the water. It wasn't beautiful because of the water or the white beach. It was beautiful because of my three children playing in the water. And I allowed my brain to reflect how blessed I am in Christ. When is the last time you allowed yourself to be separated from the world and to think about how grateful you are because of Christ? How awesome it is to be one of his brothers, fellow heirs with him. You know, I think for me, oftentimes it's very easy to sit in the same pew every Sunday and take for granted what we do. Who we're singing praises to. And take for granted the time we just got to spend. And Craig, man, a great job preparing my mind to think about that plan that God unfolded perfectly through his son. And I think there are moments in my life that I take that for granted. I think I take for granted the fact that through the gospel of Christ, through the teachings that I received through great men in my life, I was rooted in the truth. Do you know how valuable truth is? And do you know how sometimes it's so hard to determine in today's day what truth really is? And I'm telling you, with the development of AI, it could become even harder to determine what truth is and what it's not. But I stand before you this morning to tell you through God's word, through his gospel, we have truth. We have truth in something that we have been rooted in. Something that solidifies our position as fellow heirs. It solidifies our position of our eternal life with him in heaven. We have been rooted, Paul says in Colossians chapter 2 and verse 7. But it's interesting when you think about that idea of being rooted. A lot of our English versions today, I don't believe, translate it correctly. Because you look at this idea when you read Colossians chapter 2 and verse 6. Look at what he says and look at how he says it. I'm reading from the ESV, but most of our versions today say the same thing. In verse 6 he says, therefore as you received. Notice the tense in what he says from the word received. Past tense. Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him. That's present active. That's you're walking in him and you're continually going to walk in him. So walk in him as you receive him, rooted and built up. An appropriate translation would say, having been rooted, therefore build up. Having been rooted, therefore build up. Who is he speaking to in Colossians church? He's speaking to saints, those who have given their life to him. As Dan put it last week, those who have subscribed to the prescrip or subscription. Those people who have subscribed to the subscription and they are calling themselves Christians, not according to the world, worldly idea of what a Christian is. You know, I think unfortunately today Christianity comes to many by default. Well, I'm not Catholic, I'm not Mormon, I'm not this, I'm, not, I'm just a Christian. 
I want to use the terminology of Christian this morning in a biblical sense. Somebody who has chosen him as your king. A Christian is someone who has their eyes fixed, focused, desiring of his word. Somebody who calls Christ their Lord. I think Dan made the mention last week, it's not his last name, it's his title. His sovereignty. He referenced the song we sing, Pierce my ear, O Lord my God. Take me to your door this day and drive that all through my ear because I am choosing to be your slave, your doulos, your bondservant. Use me. I am mine no more, for I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. You see, it's not about me. A Christian is somebody who says it's about God and I am his slave. He is my master. And that, through the gospel of Christ, is what roots me. It's amazing how many times this concept of roots are used throughout the Bible. The the scripture reading out of Psalm chapter 1, notice where the tree was planted by streams of water. Why is that valuable? Because even in dry times, those roots sink down into the ground and they suck the water from that stream. So when it's dry, they're strong. When it's a a drought, they're strong. When the wind blows, they're strong because their roots are deep. In Jeremiah chapter 17, he says the same thing. For the roots spread out towards the water. And solidifies the tree, strengthens the tree. Or what about the parable of the sower in Matthew? The roots, uh, the plants that are are, are, are planted on, on thorny ground or rocky ground. But the plant that is planted on prepared soil develops roots. Maybe the first question we should ask ourselves this morning is this. Are you rooted? I can only answer that question for myself. Therefore, it's going to take some participation from you. Are you rooted in Christ? I think sometimes people fail and they struggle and they blow wherever the wind takes them because we're not rooted. I don't think sometimes we do a good enough job in the church to root people in the truth of the gospel. And we're not firm enough on it as parents with our children to root them in the truth of the gospel. Epaphras was a man, a great teacher in Colossae. A great teacher who came in and taught them truth in the gospel. Look over with me to Colossians chapter 1. Look at this in verse 5. Paul, in typical Pauline fashion, uh, begins the book thanking God uh, for the church there, for the saints there. He says in verse 5, Because of the hope laid up for you in heaven, of this you have heard before in the word of truth, the gospel, which has come to you as indeed in the whole world, is bearing fruit and increasing as it also does among you since the day you heard it. Listen to me. You heard it and understood it from Epaphras. Not only did you hear it, but you understood it. Do you know what happens when you understand something? Do you realize it's a lot easier to memorize something that you understand? You know why that happens? Because it sinks down, or listen to me, it's rooted down inside of you. Just as you heard it and understood it, do you know what took root in you? Paul says the truth of the gospel took root in you. That's who he's speaking to in Colossae. That's who I believe I'm speaking to this morning. People who have had the truth of the gospel rooted in our hearts, in our minds, in our souls. It's who we are, and we are planted firm. And when I am planted firm and the roots of the gospel is truth to me, I will tell you, 
maybe call me stubborn. I rather prefer rooted. There is not anything, anybody, I don't care who you are, I don't care if you have doctor behind your name, anybody that can tell me anything that will sway my belief in the truth of the gospel because I am rooted in it. That is who I am. It's hopefully what I breathe and how I function. Do I make mistakes? Absolutely. But you're not going to tell me this is not truth. I will live my life based on it. Are you rooted in it? Are you this morning rooted in the truth of the gospel that you heard when you made that commitment one day in your life to receive him as your king? You subscribed to the subscription because you wanted the gift. And that's a great thing to want. But are you re-upping your subscription every week? Are you re-upping your subscription every day? Or are you canceling it when you don't need it anymore? Paul says, be rooted you have been rooted in Christ. Therefore, that puts us in a place right now. It puts us in a place till we say, well, then what do we do next, Paul? If we subscribe to the idea of once saved is always saved, not a biblical concept, but if we subscribe to that, I can dismiss us all today, and we can go on our way if once saved is always saved. But you notice Paul never stops with that. Paul says, just as you have been rooted, then he says what? Be built up. Okay, now's our time. Now is when we take notice and we say, first of all, i got to answer the question, am I or have I been rooted in Christ? That is your first question you are to ask yourself this morning. That I have to ask myself, have I been rooted in Christ? Do I believe the gospel of Christ, the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ is a gift from God that saves me from my soul and Christ is my king? If I say yes, I've been rooted. Now Paul says, build up. Do you know why he says build up? He says build up because there's going to be a lot of things that come in and try to undermine those roots. He calls them things like philosophies, empty deceits, elementary principles of the world, if you continue reading starting in verse 8. And think about what those things look like. Those things look like postmodernism. That's what he's talking about right there. Case in point. Those things look like, well... This sounds really good over there, and I don't think I'm going to subscribe to the entire Bible. I'm just going to subscribe to the, to, to the parts I want. That's what he's talking about. Empty deceit. Elementary principles of the world. I'm going to subscribe to the things that the world says are okay. Well, the world says homosexuality is okay, and, and it's widely accepted. And, and I see all these companies' logos in the month of June, and they change them all to a rainbow, so it must be okay. And I see it on commercials, and professional athletes are showing it off, and movie stars are standing behind it. So therefore, I can say homosexuality is okay. Paul says that's an elementary principle of the world, and that will uproot you. Well... Abortion surely is okay. Don't we have rights? Yeah, you had a right to make the decision to get pregnant. Yeah, you have a right, but not to murder. Well, where are my rights? Well, I don't want to affiliate with people who don't look like me, don't walk like me, don't talk like me, and don't vote like me elementary principles of the world. You see what I'm saying? Paul says all of these things will uproot you. Therefore, he gives us the charge to build up. How can we be built up in Christ? Where do we go from here? And that's where I believe Paul continues this chapter. Notice and understand that nothing in the New Testament, especially in Paul's writings, 
are just there by themselves on a little island. Paul is not going to encourage us to do something and then, and then uh, forget what he said and, and not tell us how to do it. So I believe he gives us some ways that we can be built up in Christ. Number one, we look at verse 10. We can be built up in Christ by understanding who brings us to the fullness of life. This was a weird, weird verse for me. You know, as a preacher, I always try to give application. Like, what's the so what? How do I get people to do that? How do I do it? I look at this point about how do I be built up in Christ? How do I continually build myself up and allow my roots to be established and strong so all these philosophies and empty deceits and elementary principles of the world do not uproot me, I must, number one, understand this one fact. Do you know what the whole theme of the book of Colossians is? Christ is all we need. If you're somebody who writes in your Bible, I would encourage you, right next to the book of Colossians, up at the title, Christ is all we need. How does he start it? He starts it about the gospel that you were presented to, the truth. And then he goes what? He is the preeminence of all things. Christ is everything. Take away Christ out of Christianity, what do you have? That's not a trick question. What do you have? And the congregation said nothing. You don't have anything. Take Christ out of love and what do you have? You don't know how to do it? Take Christ out of grace, out of mercy, out of forgiveness. Do you know how to forgive? Do you know how to extend grace? And do you know how to extend mercy? Absolutely not. He is the image of the creator. In 1 John chapter 1 and verse 14, he says, And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. We got to see him. He is everything. Paul says in chapter 2 and verse 10, you have been filled with him. Look at verse 10. Read it with me. And you have been filled with him who is the head, and, uh, who is the head of all rule and authority. Uh, look at those words underlined. You have been completed in him who is the head. What good is a body without a head? You ever seen one of those? Remember that legend of Ichabod Crane, the headless horseman? That's weird. You know why that's weird? Because a body doesn't function without a what? A head. And you have been completed in him. Who is the head and the rule of all what? Authority. Who gave him that authority? God, right? We see that portrayed in the Gospels. He completes us. Guys, nothing else can complete you. You are not made perfect through anything else or through anybody else. If I were to ask you if you have made it, how would you define that question, or maybe your answer. Have you made it? Hey, maybe people will turn around and they'll, they'll look at their big house and they'll look at their retirement and they'll look at their paycheck and they'll look at their bank account. They may, maybe even they'll look at their successful kids and they'll say, we've made it. Without Christ, you have not made it. People will look at all their accomplishments and their accolades and their rewards and, and all the things they've been recognized for. And they can say, well, I've made it. Without Christ, you have not made it. Because according to this verse, the only place we receive completeness, fullness, perfection is in Christ. Do you understand that? Do you understand that? Because see, I don't believe we can truly understand what it means to be built up in Christ if we don't understand the fact that he's the one building us up. Are you alive this morning? 
Come on. We got to understand this. Because if we don't understand this, we're just like running in the sand. Man, running in the sand is hard. I watch those beach volleyball players play. Man, you don't realize it until you're trying to jump on the sand. My feet still hurt from running on the sand. I don't want to live my life that way, but if I can't understand that the only thing that completes me is Christ. I am running in the sand. Or like Solomon says, I'm striving after the wind. Vanity of vanities. All is vanity. Isn't that what Solomon's struggle was in the book of Ecclesiastes? Well, I'm going to accumulate for myself all of these riches, all of these gardens, all of these houses, all of these concubines. Well, I'm going to labor and I'm going to toil and I'm going to labor and I'm going to toil and I'm going to seek knowledge. But he says at the end of all this, the whole duty of man is to what? Seek him and love him. To obey his commandments for that, he says is the whole duty of man. That is what completes us. You ever lie awake at night and feel empty? I've been there. It's a lonely place to be. Do you know when that happens in my life? When I have spent all week longing and searching for things for me. That's when I feel most empty. Do you know when I feel most full? When I have spent time in study, in prayer, when I have spent time serving, (laughs) you've been there, right? You you come on Sunday morning and you wore out and hopefully you leave filled. It's not because of what I'm saying. Maybe I got a small part if I'm doing my job, but hopefully it's because we just worship together. I hope we understand the value of what Jed does every week to lead us in worship. Jed is not a song leader. Jed is a worship leader. He is leading us in worship, and that is as valuable as what I do. Please do not get those mixed up. Because I'll tell you what, I am filled when I am praising God, and he is my focus. Because he is the only thing that fills me. I have to understand that. Now, now, now we can get to work, see? Because now if I can understand that, now I know what I got to do next. Because the very next thing he tells us is, I got to die. I got to die to the things of the world. And he, he puts it in basically two ways. I want to show you the two different ways he puts it in Colossians chapter 2. In verse 11, he says, In him you also were circumcised with a circumcision made without hands, but putting off the dying, right? Uh, uh, Paul likens this in Romans chapter 6. The dying to the self. Uh, Galatians chapter 2 and verse 20. For I have been crucified with Christ. But he says it again in chapter 2. If you go over to chapter 2 and verse 20, he says, If with, literally that's a first class conditional statement, Mainly saying, since you have been, because who's he speaking to? People who have been what? What's on the shirts? People who have been what? Rooted. Since you have been rooted, what have you done? Look at verse 20. You have what? Died to the elementary spirits or the elemental spirits of the world. You've died to them. You know what? We don't like to die to things. I'm telling you, we don't like to die to things because we really like our things. I'm going to tell you a funny story. Uh, I don't know, maybe it was last year, summer. I went to Zach. If you don't know what Zach does, Zach's really good at knowing what chemicals to spray on certain plants to make them do certain things. That's pretty close as all I got. I don't know what he does. But he meets with these farmers and he says, if you need to kill something, I got something to spray on it. If you need to kill a a fungus on it, I know what to spray on it. If you want it to grow, I know what to spray on it. So I went to him and I said, I need help with my yard. My yard is really green. Wheat. Every week, sometimes twice a week, I mow my green weeds. It's not my green yard. And my yard looks really good from about 100 feet away. 
You get much closer, it's just weeds. So I went to Zach and I said, okay, how do I have grass? And he says, okay, here's what we got to do. We got to kill everything. You ever seen a dead yard? I grew up in Southern California. If you don't water a yard in Southern California, it turns brown. And you know what it is when it turns brown? It's ugly. He says, we got to kill everything. And the first picture in my mind went to this ugly brown field. And I said, I don't want to kill it. He says, you're going to have to have weeds then. You're just going to have a green yard full of weeds. Guess what I have today? A green yard full of weeds. Because we don't like to die. I think maybe there's a parallel there in our lives. And maybe some of us are walking around with a green yard full of weeds that looks good from 100 feet, but we've not died to those sins in our lives. Because we don't like the consequences. We don't like the work. And I'll be honest with you guys, it takes work, doesn't it? It takes work to die to sin. It's hard. And I'm convinced the harder we try to die to sin, the harder Satan's going to put those sins back in front of us again. Some of you may be going through those struggles right now. It is not to be taken lightly. Because we don't want a brown yard. But over and over and over again, in the passages that I mentioned, Paul said, we have to die to live. We have to die to live. I could have had Zach pray his ma- spray his magical solution on my yard. And I've seen his yard. It's beautiful. I have no doubt my yard could have looked like his yard. But I wasn't willing to die to it. Are you willing to die to those sins? I don't know what those sins are in your life. But we're humans, so I know we all struggle with them. Maybe it's pride, anger, selfishness. I don't want to die to them because I don't want my yard to be brown. I'm convinced... I'm convinced people don't repent of sins like they should and seek help because we don't want to be seen as a brown yard. I'll tell you what, there have been Sundays that I should have been sitting on this front pew at the end of my lesson, but I don't want somebody to see me like a brown yard. But we cannot build up until we die first. That scriptural fact. He continues on then. Not only do I need to die to the things of the world. But then in chapter 3 verses 1 through 4 tells us we need to set our minds on him. We need to set our minds on, on, on who he is. You ever thought about what it means to set your mind on something? Are you good at that? Some people, I I think, are better at it than others. You know, I'm one of those one-track minds. Like, when I get something in my mind, watch out. I I sympathize with Amanda because, man, I get something on my mind, whether it's building a truck or hunting season's coming up. Amanda said, you trim your beard? I said, no way. I'm getting ready for those cold November days. I'm going to let it grow because I have set my mind on it. We set our mind on a lot of things. You in here who run, you set your mind on the prize. That's the point Paul makes in 1 Corinthians chapter 9. Runners don't run aimlessly, but they set their mind on the prize. In Colossians chapter 3, look up what Paul says. If we're going to build up, going back to our, our text, rooted and built up in him, established in the faith, He says, since you have been raised, there's our first class conditional cause again, chapter 3 and verse 1. Since you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above. Whenever you hear the word seek, is there another verse that maybe come up in your mind? 
maybe Matthew chapter 6 and verse 33. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added unto you. Seek. Isn't it amazing how the Bible is all intertwined, woven together and it just works? You know why it works? Because God wrote it. It just works. And he says, seek the things that are above where Christ is. The fullness. He's the one who completes us. Remember, seek those things. Seated at the right hand of God, set your mind. Not only are we seeking the things, we're setting our mind on the things that are above, not on things of this earth. For you have died. There's the point again. And your life is hidden with Christ in God. Huh. What is your mind set on? I'm going to think about a couple different people. I'm going to think about those people in Acts chapter 2. And if you read verse 42, it says they devoted. You can go ahead and put that next slide up there for me. It says they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the fellowship, and to the breaking of bread. I want you to look at that first word and go, are you devoted? Because if I'm setting my mind and seeking the things that are above, it takes a level of devotion. Do you think about, in Acts chapter 2 and verse 42, why they devoted themselves to those things? Because they wanted to know more. They longed for it. There was a fire to know it. Have you lost that fire? That means of devotion? <laughs> but if you look at the next two words, those two E words, you may be thinking to yourself, I know where he's going. Think about another group of people in the book of Acts who devoted themselves to scripture maybe we look at Acts chapter 17 and verse 11 open your Bibles to Acts 17 and verse 11 I want you to look at how the Bereans thought they could set their minds on things above because you see if I'm going to set my mind on things above, I need to be focused or devoted on the things above. And what is the best resource for us to find things out about the things above? God's word. It's from him. But look at what he says in Acts chapter 17 and verse 11. They received the word with all eagerness. How many of you were eager, <laughs> don't answer that, to come this morning? Like, when you're eager to go do something, have you ever noticed this? If you're eager to go do something, you could set your alarm at 6 o'clock and you're up by 5. Anybody happen to you this morning? <laughs> don't lie to me. <laughs> Are we eager? Oh, there's Bible study? Oh, I'm so there. I know we struggle with that because I see our numbers on Wednesday night. <laughs> I'm telling you what, I know, I know. Did you hear the gasp just then? Did you hear it? I heard it. Because I'll be honest, if I wasn't a preacher, I may not be as eager as I am. If I can just be honest with everybody. But if I want to set my mind on things above, man, I want to be like the Bereans who were eager to examine the scripture. Because what were they eager to do? Look at the next E. They were eager to examine. Notice examine is different than reading. Notice examining is different than listening. They were eager, or with all eagerness, 1711 says. With all eagerness, they examined the scriptures once a week. <laughs> Those of you who are looking at your scripture are going, I don't know what version he's reading from. <laughs> they examined the scriptures, let me hear it. 
daily. And they were eager to examine the scripture daily. I'm telling you what, I'm stepping all over my toes right now too. Chuck Mullen is a beloved friend of mine. No, he is my brother. And he encourages me often to examine the scriptures daily. I get random texts. Hey, are you keeping up on your personal Bible study? You know what he's telling me? He's saying, are you keeping up with your personal examination of scripture. I'm convinced my hard days are hard because I don't spend enough time examining the scriptures daily. I feel sometimes that I'm moved by every wind and wave of different things in this world with the latest and greatest thing, the things that I have set my mind on, and I get lost and I get muddied in all of the things that are happening because I don't devote myself eagerly to examining the scriptures daily. You, you want something to do that will help you? You want the so what of this lesson? The so what is sometimes our struggles are self-conflicted because we're not being built up in Christ daily. Sometimes my struggles are self-inflicted because a while ago I was rooted in the gospel and the truth. I had some great men that I sat at their feet and listened to the truth expounded to me. And I made that commitment as much as, as most of you have. You made that commitment to call him your master, your king, your lord. But our struggles are self-inflicted because we have stopped building up daily. We don't fully understand that he's the only one who brings us to the fullness of life. We don't die to the things of the world. And we don't set our minds on him every day. We can be conquerors in this world, in our daily lives, in our jobs, at school. We can overcome trials and tribulations. We can overcome heartache. We can overcome difficulties when we are rooted and built up in Christ. Are you rooted and built up in him this morning? Or have you simply bought the subscription and have canceled it because you've already thought you've gotten the free gift? There may be somebody here this morning who has felt like at one time they were rooted but these things of the world have come in and they've taken them out of uh, their, your roots. You, you've been deflated. You, you've, you've come up. Maybe the tree is dying and you need the encouragement of this body. Man, look around. There's a lot of beautiful people wanting you to be rooted. And together, we can help build each other up daily. Maybe you don't have a relationship with him yet. Maybe in your life you have thought everything's just fine. But until you understand that only he brings you to perfection, your life will be a struggle. And things will break. And things will tear down. So maybe this morning is the time for you to say, I need Christ as my Lord as my savior, dying of self, turning that yard green so in the spring you can come up green and perfectly lush green grass. I don't know what your need is this morning, but now's the time. If you need to come forward, why together we stand and while we sing. Tom.